On December 7, 1941, a large strike force of 353 Japanese fighters and bombers was launched from the deck of six aircraft carriers and headed towards the harbor of Oahu. At that day, the attack on Pearl Harbor became a heavy strike for the United States, which had tied the country into World War II and became a source of painful lessons. One of these lessons which changed the course of military strategy was the understanding of how powerful an aircraft carrier can be. Over the following years, the US Navy in the Pacific Ocean grew stronger, pushing the Japanese armed forces further and further to the islands of the rising sun. Soon the aircraft carrier became the main weapon of the fleet, suppressing enemy forces at sea, supporting the advance of their forces on land, and soon beating even the seemingly indestructible sea titans, battleships. The lessons of World War II were learned, and after 1945, aircraft carriers remained the main demonstration of the flag and the main projector of the US force on the seas around the world. Since the end of World War II, decades have passed, generations of sailors have changed, presidents and governments have changed, and the aircraft carriers changed as well. The American fleet met the 21st century, being armed with a group of the largest ships of this type, the Nimitz class. However, developed in the 1970s, these giants have become obsolete and will soon give way to their heirs, the first representative of which has already been created. USS Gerald R. Ford, CVN-78, is the first ship of the new generation of nuclear aircraft carriers, named after the 38th US President Gerald Ford, who during World War II served on one of the aircraft carriers of the Pacific Fleet. The history of this vessel began in 2005, with the signing of the historic contract between the US Navy and Northrop Grumman Shipbuilding to create the first ship of the new class. The giant's kill was laid in 2009 at the Newport News shipyard in Virginia. Construction was carried out at a rapid pace. To speed up the work, the shipyards used the already fairly common methodology of assembling large ships from prefabricated blocks. The entire sections are created in factory and then mounted on the ship, like Legos. By 2013, the assembly of the main structure was almost complete. About 500 blocks, elements of the ship, were welded together in the dock. At the end of January 2013, a 555-ton aircraft carrier island was mounted on the deck, a tower in which the ship and air force controls are located. And after a few months, the carrier received the brightest but hidden element of the power plant, four 30-ton propellers. Soon the internal installation work began, which is no less challenging than the assembly of the aircraft carrier's hull. While inside the ship, hundreds of workers were assembling and launching insane amounts of equipment, on the outside it looked like an almost finished aircraft carrier, especially after painting the hull. It took 200,000 gallons or about 750 tons of paint to give it the classic gray color. In the fall of 2013, the vessel received its official name, CBN 78 Gerald R. Ford, and passed the launch ceremony. The daughter of President Ford broke the bottle over the hull. In this ceremony, there was another important symbolism. As part of the fleet, a new aircraft carrier replaced the USS Enterprise, the first representative of this type of ships equipped with a nuclear power plant. After serving more than 50 years, this veteran left the fleet. However, its replacement was delayed. Initially, Gerald Ford was supposed to become a part of the Navy in 2013, but due to difficulties in assembly and testing, this plan had shifted. With an increase in the time of creation, expenses grew, reaching the amount of $12.8 billion and making Gerald Ford the most expensive ship ever built. Problems and delays were caused mainly by complications in the implementation of a number of completely new systems that were not used on aircraft carriers before. The overall structure of the vessel was ready for several years, while the inside systems were developing. The onboard systems are the main innovation of the ship. Externally, the Ford class aircraft carriers are not very different from the vessels of the Nimitz class. The new ship has a length of 1,092 feet, or 333 meters, like its predecessor, George H. W. Bush, the latest Nimitz. Their displacement is almost the same and amounts to about 100,000 tons. The most bright visual difference is the redesigned island. It is higher by 20 feet, or 6 meters, 
occupies a smaller area on the deck and is also shifted back. This layout allowed to redesign the deck and make it larger without increasing the dimensions of the ship. Otherwise it would be difficult for non-specialists to understand which ship they are looking at. So what does the Pentagon spend so much money on? The differences are not visible from the outside, but with all the similarities the filling of the ship is completely new and much more efficient. Gerald Ford is equipped with the most complex airspace control system, which allows not only to direct its aircraft and helicopters, but also to monitor large portions of the sky above the fleet. The core of this complex is the group of the newest active electronically scanned array radars. Such stations are much more efficient than the classic ones, and are used only on some military aircraft and the latest ships. In work with the air wing, the main weapon of the aircraft carrier, the innovation was in the replacement of the good old steam catapults with the brand new electromagnetic aircraft launch system. The first tests of the EMALs on the ship were carried out in 2015. These electromagnetic catapults are the first precedent of the use of such systems in the military vessels. They are much more efficient than the steam launchers, easier to operate and more compact. In addition, such catapults are more flexible and work in a larger range of mass, which will allow optimal launching of both heavy planes and light drones. The number of aircraft that Gerald Ford is able to launch during the day increases by a quarter, and the number of personnel required for them significantly decreases. The same applies to many other systems. With the visual similarity to the Nimitz, Ford is much more computerized, which is obvious. The first ships of the previous generation were made in the 1970s, when the internet wasn't even created. Now the technology is completely different, and the ships are different too. Under the new requirements, Ford received the most complex cable network with a total length of more than 1900 miles, or 3000 kilometers, plus about 750 miles, or 1200 kilometers, of optical fiber cables. In general, due to this technical advancement, the crew was greatly reduced. The Nimitz-class vessels required the service of 3,500 people, not counting the air wing, while Ford requires a little more than 2,600, almost 900 crew members less. Given that the internal volume remains the same, the engineers managed to make the ship more comfortable for the sailors. Another important advantage is the fiery heart of Ford or more precisely two nuclear hearts. The ship is equipped with the newest A1B nuclear reactors, created specifically for it by the Bechtel Corporation. One of the main problems of the Nimitz carriers in their recent years was their reactors. The Westinghouse A4W was quite good for its time, but the updated onboard systems turned out to be too demanding for electricity, and the capabilities of reactors of the old design were sometimes lacking. The new reactors have thermal power of up to 700 megawatts, which is 25% more than its predecessors had. But the additional power went almost entirely into the production of electricity. By this indicator, Ford surpasses the Nimitz several times. Additional power is needed not only to meet the modern requirements of onboard equipment and, for example, electromagnetic catapults, but also to work with the advanced systems, such as the laser air defense systems, which in the future may replace the Phalanx close-in weapon system. Problems with the modification of the old Nimitz with the new technologies became a lesson for shipbuilders. During the creation of the Ford class, it was initially taken into account that the ship would continue to be improved all the time. These systems, as well as a number of other new elements, required additional study and testing, which delayed the construction of the aircraft carrier. In fact, the ship was ready for tests only in 2017. In the spring of 2017, the aircraft carrier first started sailing using its own power plant and soon began to perform sea trials. Finally, after the completion of the main testing stage, the Newport shipyards delivered the nuclear aircraft carrier Gerald R. Ford to the US Navy. In total, about 5,000 shipbuilders worked on the ship. Nevertheless, improvements and some tests on the ship continue. Now the aircraft carrier is expecting its main weapon. At the initial stage, it will receive an air wing of 75 airplanes and helicopters, the core of which, of course, will be the F-35 fighter jets and various modifications of the F-A-18, as well as many other flying machines, plus full crew of about 4,500 people. 
According to the schedule, the new aircraft carrier will start its full service by 2020 and will operate as part of the fleet for at least 50 years. Some people from the military have noticed that with these figures the last captain of the ship at the moment most likely is not even born yet. The shipyards have already begun work on other Ford class ships. It is assumed that 10 aircraft carriers will be delivered, 5 of which have already been ordered. Now two of them are being built at once, the CVN-79 John F. Kennedy and CVN-80 Enterprise. The track just doesn't work without the Enterprise. According to approximate calculations, a group of three fully equipped aircraft carriers will cost the Pentagon $42 billion. Not a bad budget. The new generation of flagships was the answer to the new generation of challenges that the 21st century brought to the US Navy. Now history will judge whether these titans will remain the masters of the sea in this century, or new technology and strategy will make some other vessels the leaders, like once the aircraft carriers themselves took dominion over the sea from the battleships. That's all for today. Like the video and subscribe to the channel not to miss any future stories.